I'm Norm Eisen, and I'm a senior fellow in governance studies here at Brookings and the chair of our Leveraging Transparency to Reduce Corruption, LTRC initiative. I'm delighted to welcome all of you to today's conversation on combating corruption to drive democratic renewal. I do so on behalf of our event co-sponsors, Brookings, LTRC, the German Marshall Fund of the United States, the Center for European Policy Analysis, SIPA, and the FACT Coalition, and last but far from least, the Transatlantic Democracy Working Group, which I also co-chair. So I'm wearing a lot of hats today. Today's discussion is part of the civil society kickoff of this week's Summit for Democracy. And it is also the occasion for the launch of our Democracy Playbook 2021 edition. As we know all too well, democracies around the world are under stress with their institutions and norms challenged and in some cases undermined by illiberal actors. As TI notes, the failure to significantly control corruption is contributing to a crisis in democracy around the world since corruption undermines democratic institutions and in turn, weak institutions are less able to control corruption. The Summit for Democracy is an important step towards grappling with this issue and reversing that vicious interaction between uh, corruption and democratic backsliding, flipping it to a virtuous cycle of fighting corruption and advancing democracy. The months and years to come will be make or break periods for democracy, both on the anti-corruption front and on other main issues, and we must all rise to the challenge. That's why I'm so pleased we're launching our Democracy Playbook, the 2021 Democracy Summit Edition. You'll hear more, much more about that from my fellow co-authors in the second half of the program. And having this event with our distinguished speakers today. Both our report and today's conversation will highlight concrete ways that government, civil society, and private sector actors can combat corruption and defend democracy. I would also like to thank the co-authors of our Democracy Playbook, uh, Susan Cork, Jonathan Katz, Andrew Keneally, James Lamond, Alina Polyakova, and Tori Tausig. Here in the US, the Biden administration has underscored its intent to combat corruption and promote democracy with President Biden stating that fighting corruption is not just good governance, it is self-defense, it is patriotism, and it's essential to the preservation of our democracy and our future. That includes cracking down on tax havens and illicit financing that contribute to income inequality, fund terrorism and generate pernicious foreign influence. And uh, today is also the occasion of the release of the United States government's comprehensive anti-corruption strategy. And you're gonna hear more about that from our first speaker. The Department of the Treasury has an important role to play in tackling these issues. And we are so delighted to have with us today, my friend, the Deputy Secretary of the Treasury, Wally Adiyamo. Deputy Secretary Adiyama will share remarks and join Brookings President John Allen in conversation to further address anti-corruption priorities. I will then moderate a panel discussion with a distinguished group of anti-corruption and democracy experts through the lens of the upcoming Summit for Democracy and the release of our Democracy Playbook 2021 which features 10 commitments. They're like the 10 commandments, but they're the 10 commitments for fighting against democratic backsliding and promoting democracy. So stay tuned for that. But first, I'd like to turn to Brookings President John Allen. John? Norm, thank you very much uh, for those terrific introductory remarks. And if anyone who has been tuned in this morning has any doubt 
about uh, who the secret weapon is at the Brookings Institution to strengthen not just American, but global democracy. It's Norm Eisen, and uh, he has led a great team, not just inside the institution, but a great team across other institutions and other elements of the government to deal with the issue of creating this virtuous cycle that he's talked about, to strengthen democracy and to get at those components uh, that may well, in fact, uh, cause the deterioration or the backsliding of democracy. So ladies and gentlemen, it's an honor to be with you this morning. I'm John Allen and I'm the president of the Brookings Institution. Uh, and I'm pleased to welcome you to this first event, uh, Combating Corruption to Drive Democratic Renewal, a kickoff event for the Summit for Democracy. Now, today's event will provide key insight into President Biden's Summit for Democracy, which is scheduled to happen later this week on December 9th and 10th for two days. Nations from around the world uh, will discuss several important topics, including the fight against corruption. And with us today is someone most familiar with this issue, Deputy Secretary of the U.S. Treasury, Wally Adiamo, who was sworn into his current position on the 26th of March, 2021, as the Deputy Secretary. And he has dedicated most of his career to public service. And sir, we are honored and grateful for your dedication to our country, our dedication to our democracy. He became a prolific, he began a prolific career in government uh, but was also a member of the Brookings family before he went into government. And here he served as the editor of the Brookings Hamilton Project, which produces evidence-based policy proposals uh, and analyses to promote broad-based broad economic growth. So in some respects, Deputy Secretary, welcome home. It goes to the old Brookings uh, motto, once hired, always hired. Shortly after, he joined the Obama administration, serving in prestigious roles such as the Deputy National Security Advisor for Economic, International Economics and the Deputy Director for the National Economic Council. A graduate of UC California or UC Berkeley and the Yale Law School, he is a world-renowned expert on such issues as international finance, trade investment, energy, and environmental issues. We could not be more honored than to have Deputy Secretary Adeyamo engage with us today on these important topics and to help us to kick off this critical issue. So with that, sir, let me turn the floor over to you for your brief keynote remarks. I'll come back at the end and we'll have about 20 minutes of questions and answers. So sir, over to you. Well, let me say a word of thanks to General Allen and to Ambassador Eisen and the Brookings Institution for inviting me to speak today. It's great to be back um, home. Um, once again. This week, as General Allen mentioned, President Biden is hosting the inaugural Summit for Democracy. Representatives of 111 nations will discuss how we can collectively advance a system of government that provides people with the right to define their destiny, including efforts to fight corruption. As those of you who work on these issues know well, there are good reasons to put anti-corruption at the center of our efforts to promote democracy. Democracy depends fundamentally on institutions and on trust. Institutions perform the fundamental work of democratic government from faithfully representing the interests of the people to ensuring everyone pays the taxes they owe. Institutions in turn depend on trust. Trust between citizens to resolve their differences through democratic processes rather than outside it and trust in the government to provide effective leadership in times of calm and crisis. Corruption, unfortunately, is corrosive to both. It siphons resources away from democratic institutions and erodes people's trust that these institutions will serve them in the first place. According to an IMF study, corruption costs governments around the world $1 trillion in lost revenues each year. Though we know why corruption is such a problem, how we combat corruption is often more challenging especially where it intersects with the US and global financial systems. Corruption thrives in the financial shadows, in shell corporations that disguise owners' true identities, in offshore jurisdictions with lax anti-money laundering regulations, and in complex structures that allow the wealthy to hide their income from government authorities. This is not a problem that can be solved by law enforcement agencies alone. 
it is critical that finance ministries around the world play a central role in rooting out corruption. That is why Secretary Yellen has called on the Department of Treasury to focus on combating corruption as part of a whole of government strategy announced earlier today. Today, I'd like to share some of the nuts and bolts of Treasury's plan to combat corruption, promote democracy, and protect the integrity of the financial system. Our approach is driven by three major lines of effort. One, improving transparency. Two, increasing enforcement. And three, deepening our partnerships. Let's take transparency first. For too long, corrupt actors have made their home in the darkest corners of the global financial system, stashing the profits of their illegitimate activities in our blind spots. A, ma a major component of our anti-corruption work is about changing that, shining the spotlight on these areas and using what we find to deter and go after corruption. Shell corporations and fund companies are one of these corners. Current U.S. law allows those seeking to hide their financial activities to form companies anonymously without disclosing who ultimately owns and profits from them. That makes moving illicit funds into the U.S. financial system especially enticing for criminals and corrupt actors. And it makes it even more important that the federal government has the tools to prevent and combat it. Let me provide a quick example. In March, the Department of Justice unveiled charges against 10 Iranian nationals for a scheme involving more than $300 million in illicit transactions on behalf of the Iranian government. That scheme ran for nearly 20 years because its participants used US-based front companies to hide the nature of their activities. This scheme was not only a crime, but it provided a state sponsor of terrorism with the resources to fund activities that put our national security at risk. Over the last year, the Treasury Bureau charged with administering anti-money laundering laws and regulations, the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, or FinCEN, has been working hard to change this by implementing the Corporate Transparency Act. This law, for the first time, requires certain types of US and foreign companies to disclose their beneficial owners. The law also enables FinCEN to build a central registry of this information that will be shared with law enforcement and national security agencies. Treasury is taking an aggressive stance in implementation of the CTA, pursuing an approach that will arm us with the information we need to deter and fight corruption at home and abroad. We're doing this in collaboration with the business community who share our interest in rooting out corruption and protecting our national security. We're well cognizant that new rules like this one can impose compliance burdens on companies, especially small businesses. This is why we're working to ensure the cost of compliance on average will be less than $50 per company. Another of these dark corners is the real estate market. Today, certain all cash real estate transactions are not subject to permanent anti-money laundering rules or requirements for beneficial ownership disclosure. As a result, our real estate markets are at risk of becoming a safe haven for criminals, kleptocrats, and others seeking to park corrupt profits. For example, it's been reported that the brother of former Democratic Republic of Congo President Joseph Kaliba embezzled millions in government funds and stashed some of them in the U.S. real estate worth nearly $3.5 million. He was reportedly able to turn these illicit funds into valuable assets by making these purchases in cash. Taking advantage of this long-standing gap in U.S. anti-money laundering rules. For nearly two decades, a bipartisan coalition of elected officials and experts have called for action to stop these forms of corruption from finding shelter in our economy. That is why today, Treasury announced FinCEN's plan to seek public comment on how to close this loophole in the real estate market. We look forward to working with people like the experts in this room, local officials, and the private sector to develop a regulatory approach that will safeguard the integrity of our markets and root out corruption in American real estate. The second prong of our anti-corruption work focuses on enforcement. Using the new information we gather to go after corrupt actors with sanctions and other enforcement tools and arming our law enforcement partners and sister agencies with the best possible information to investigate and prosecute crimes of corruption like bribery, embezzlement, and extortion. 
In October, Treasury released the results of our review of U.S. sanctions policy. The review offered several recommendations to modernize our sanctions tools, including to adopt a structured policy framework that ties our sanctions to clear policy objectives, renew our commitment to multilateralism, calibrate sanctions to mitigate unintended impacts, and modernize our sanctions technology and infrastructure. Treasury is working with our colleagues across the government and our allies and partners on operationalizing the results of the review, including how to use our anti-corruption sanctions authority with these principles in mind. We also plan to use new resources like beneficial ownership data to help implement the review's recommendations and enhance the targeting and efficacy of our sanctions actions. To date, Treasury has designated 216 targets with our anti-corruption sanctions authority. Today, under this authority, Treasury is designating an individual for providing material support to Dan Gertler, a billionaire who amassed his fortune through hundreds of millions of dollars worth of corrupt mining and oils deals in the Democratic Republic of Congo, as well 12 entities owned or controlled by this individual. Treasury's enforcement actions go beyond sanctions. They also include criminal law enforcement. For example, the IRS's Criminal Investigation Division has worked closely with the Department of Justice and Homeland Security to investigate and prosecute a former Ecuadorian official who laundered bribery payments through the United States. The official, who accepted more than $5 million in bribes to direct government contracts to three reinsurance companies, was ultimately sentenced to more than four years in prison earlier this year. With per capita GDP in Ecuador standing at less than $6,000, cases like this highlight the role of corruption in both eroding trust in public institutions and undermining economic fairness. The truth is, attempts by the wealthy and powerful to deprive the public of resources also exist within our own borders. Today, the top 1% of earners in the United States underpay their taxes by more than $160 billion a year, depriving every other American of the money we need to invest in things that benefit the whole country, like roads, childcare, and education. The president believes it is fundamentally unfair that the wealthy are allowed to play by a different set of rules when it comes to paying their taxes. That's why the Build Back Better Act includes substantial new funding for tax compliance, giving the IRS the tools it needs to identify and go after tax avoidance. This enhanced tax enforcement will not only generate $400 billion in revenue over the next decade, it will help deter tax avoidance and assist Treasury in identifying instances of corruption, working side by side with the tools provided under the Corporate Transparency Act. This brings me to the final piece of our anti-corruption plan, partnership. We're working to expand our partnership in the fight against corruption with our allies and partners abroad, with the private sector, and with civil society groups. We cannot stop corruption at home if we do not also help stamp it out abroad. According to data from SWIFT, more than 40% of global payments are conducted in euros or pounds, roughly the same share as the dollar. The globalized nature of the financial system means that our efforts to keep illicit funds out of U.S. markets cannot succeed if other jurisdictions offer an open door for them. We're fortunate to have a growing consensus around this view. The U.N., the G20, the G7, and the Financial Action Task Force, the FATF, are important partners. And we're working with them to ensure that many of the measures I discussed today are applied elsewhere. For example, we're working with the FATF to bolster global standards for beneficial ownership, transparency, and remove opportunities for regulatory arbitrage. And we're working with the multinational institutions like the IMF and World Bank to help incorporate rigorous anti-corruption standards into their lending policies. Let me also take this moment to affirm our commitment to partnering with the private sector on anti-corruption efforts. Our transparency initiatives depend not only on implementation and compliance by the private sector, but also on the sector's proactive vigilance. Financial institutions and other private sector organizations must undertake robust due diligence and actively seek to avoid corrupt clients and counterparties to keep our financial system secure. Their efforts to gather and share this information help feed a 
virtuous cycle, allowing us to better target our actions and minimize the cost on the private sector while protecting our national security. And of course, we are grateful for the continued partnership of civil society to investigate corruption and provide us with critical information to inform our anti-corruption priorities, policies, and enforcement. We want to work towards deepening this partnership in the months and years to come. In closing, I want to reiterate our fundamental view that nobody should be able to play by a different set of rules. That's why Treasury will remain focused on ensuring the rich, the powerful, and the corrupt cannot use the global financial system to protect their illicit assets or avoid paying their fair share. In doing this work, Treasury's goal is to promote democracy, to safeguard America's national security, and protect the fairness and integrity of our economy. I believe that with the actions we've announced today and the ones we'll announce this week and in the future, we are closer to those goals. With that, I'm looking forward to our conversation. Well, Deputy Secretary Adeyamo, thank you for those terrific remarks. And it's really an exciting time, I think, for the, for the department, an exciting time for our country. Certainly at Brookings, uh, we're excited about the Summit uh, for Democracy and the work that we've done on the, the Democracy Playbook. Now, sir, you've laid out a number of things, three particular areas, <clears throat> but as you've said, and as Norm said before you, um, this issue is really a national security issue. Uh, as, as the president said, uh, quote, corruption threatens United States national security, economic equity, global anti-poverty and development efforts and democracy itself. And the term uh, corrosion or the corrosive effects of corruption, uh, we can't overstate how bad that uh, can be for democracies, especially in fledgling democracies around the world. Treasury is such an important uh, part of this, and not, not just in the interagency context, but also uh, as a department by itself. So you've laid out some of the work that you're doing today Deputy Secretary Adeyamo, what, do you, what could you say in summary uh, that uh, specifically points to Treasury's support of the President's view that getting after corruption is a matter of national security? Secretary Allen, you know these, the issues of national security better than um, anyone. I think it's important for us to realize that um, in order to protect our national security, it requires us to also protect the financial system. And oftentimes, people who seek to take advantage of our country or um, our allies and partners um, do so by benefiting from illicit financial support. So a big part of this for us is making sure that we do everything we can to protect our financial system with the knowledge that oftentimes these issues of corruption aren't issues that only exist in faraway countries, but those people who gain this illicit support in financials in faraway countries often move that money to places like Miami or South Dakota or Delaware. So a big piece of this for us is actually implementing the beneficial ownership rules that Congress um, provided us with the authority to implement um, last year. It's been a central piece of work for us because we know by doing this, it provides us both with better transparency as to who the real owners are of corporations in our country and how the money is moving within those companies in a way that um, furthers some of this illicit activity. The example that I stated of the Iranian actors um, who were taking advantage, not just of the financial system, but of the American financial system, um, was a clear sense of what the national security risk is without rules like the beneficial ownership rule that we are working to put out as quickly as possible. So a big piece of this is transparency because both transparency provides more information to the people who are governed but it also provides information to law enforcement entities and to national security entities. I think a big piece of this is once that transparency exists, the way to deter people from taking these actions is actually by using the enforcement tools that also exist. And that's why today we've announced the sanctions that we're announcing against um, the associates of Dan Gentler, Gentler to demonstrate that where we have information, we will act and we will act in a way that cut people off from the United States financial system. And then finally, the last thing I would say is partnership, because as you know well, General, the global financial system is interconnected. Money moves quickly, and it moves to jurisdictions where there is a lax 
um, rules and regulations. And while we're closing down holes in our regulatory approach in the United States, the only way to prevent these corrupt actors from moving the money somewhere else is by working closely with other countries to do the same in their jurisdictions, of building a regulatory architecture that prevents illicit funds from moving into those countries is going to be critical to a global anti-corruption effort. Well, thank you for that explanation. I, I remember from a previous life, and I was so happy to hear you talk about the Iranians. Uh, as we sought to sh shape the theater to deal with Iranian behavior, you know, we were always operating some, in many respects in the physical domain, and we were limited in so many ways on how we could move forces or employ intelligence assets. But the one thing um, that the Iranians, no matter which direction they turned, they ran head on either into the Treasury Department or our allies uh, that work within the financial sector. Uh, and in so many ways, when we talk about one of the most powerful uh, forces on the planet, uh, one of the most powerful forces that America can wield on the planet, it's not about 10 carrier strike groups you know, in many cases, it's about the financial sector and what Treasury can do. Uh, and we're, we were always so proud of what the Treasury Department was able to do and now so proud of what the Treasury Department is, is about to do. Um, as you've noted, uh, the Biden administration has made it clear that advancing equity for all is both a moral imperative and critical to our economic success. It, it's also an essential dimension of promoting, quote, democracy, which protects human rights, promotes human dignity, and upholds the rule of law, which we all want so badly, unquote. So how does this, the new initiatives that you talked about today uh, advance economic fairness? And how does Treasury uh, seek to advance economic fairness through <clears throat> its other work domestically and very importantly, abroad? So, John, Alan, I appreciate the question. I think one of the things that we all recognize is today, globally, we are all suffering from a pandemic that respects no, no borders. And in countries all over the world, the thing that they need to address the pandemic is additional resources for public health, um, fiscal resources. They need to be able to spend money from their budgets to do this. But as I stated in my remarks, the IMF estimates that because of corruption, governments around the world are missing out on $1 trillion a year in revenues. $1 trillion a year of revenues that can help fight the pandemic, that can help invest in their children, invest in their infrastructure, and invest in their futures. And as I also stated, this isn't only a problem that exists beyond our borders. Today in America, it's estimated that the top 1% of income earners underpay their taxes by $160 billion. Fundamentally, this is unfair. Um, unfair to taxpayers in the United States, unfair to taxpayers around the world. And this is why the president is focused on making sure that there aren't different sets of rules for different people in our country, but that also exists globally. Um, it's why the president has been so focused on making sure that while we take the steps to do things like implement our real estate, um, a set of rules and a regime around real estate to make sure that um, people aren't able to take their corrupt assets from a foreign country and buy real estate in the United States to protect those assets. We also need to be very focused and vigilant on making sure that we do this globally, working with our international partners. Because fundamentally, um, it isn't only about fairness, it's also about making sure that our countries have the resources we need to invest in our future. That's absolutely terrific. Investing in the future is the only way we'll succeed and strengthen our democracy and those of our friends, allies, and partners overseas. Now, let me ask, uh, I think this will be our final question. Um, you've noted uh, that America's interest in a strong, stable, and rules-based economic order is also deeply entwined with our foreign policy and our national security interests. Our economic objectives cannot succeed if the international financial system facilitates the illicit flow of funds to oppressive regimes, terrorist groups, cyber criminals, and other malign actors. And they all seem to come out of the same pot and they all seem to work together. Could you expand on some of these key challenges that, uh, that you face as the Deputy Secretary of Treasury and the opportunities that the Treasury Department sees with respect to combating these illicit flows? 
I'm happy to, um, General Allen. I'll start out by talking about something I know you worked closely with the Treasury Department on in terms of countering the finance of um, ISIS. Uh, and I think there, what we did was we used the innovations and what we had learned over the years to counter the finances of a group that was largely, that um, was, was hard to target, um, but we were able to innovate. Um, and use innovation to come after their finances in order to support the great work that you are doing around the world. That's exactly what we have to do today. Um, the truth is that those people who seek to use the financial system to move illicit gains are innovating all the time. Um, one of the innovations is that they are using new sources and new methods to move money. Um, one of them is cryptocurrency today. And the big focus has been around trying to make sure that we extend the regulatory regime that we have built to prevent the movement of illicit finance finances to capture new technologies, working closely with the private sector to do this, but also making clear that where people are unwilling to adopt the rules-based order that has been designed over years to protect our financial system, we will take actions using our criminal law enforcement, working closely with the DOJ, but also our sanctions regime to go forward. We recognize that the financial system is gonna innovate and where innovation exists, um, those that are looking to move money illicitly are going to try and take advantage of that um, innovation. But the thing that I think is important for us to also recognize is that many of the kleptocrats or those moving to use, looking to move um, corrupt assets use tr the traditional financial system every day. That's why going after cash transactions in real estate is so important because the example I stated earlier about um, the um, real estate transaction that happened in all cash that was done by um, a relative or a corrupt individual didn't happen somewhere in the middle of, of the country. It happened right here in Washington, D.C., um, that someone was able to buy a, a $3.5 million property um, using an all cash transaction, using illicitly gained um, resources. So it's critical that we think about what we can do to keep up with innovation, but it's also important to realize that in many of these cases, people are buying front companies or trying to buy real estate using traditional means, using cash, and it's critical that we expand our regulatory regime to capture that as well. And we know that if we do this in the United States, the truth is that people are going to try and move these resources from the United States to other jurisdictions. That's why it's critical that we do exactly what you did in the counter, counter ISIS campaign, which was internationalize our efforts and make sure that we're building a broad coalition around the world to prevent corruption. And that's exactly what we're doing here at Treasury today. What a terrific answer. Thank you so much. Let me, uh, with one short question, because I know your time is extremely limited and we're so grateful for every minute you've given us. You know, Treasury often uh, is, is relatively unknown to the American people. Uh, we have this sense of this enormous institution that is an engine for American democracy and it, it has become even a greater engine now. Could you tell the listeners, those who are tuned in this morning, tell us a little about the people that are in the Treasury Department. Well, thank you for asking me that, because I think one of the things that we celebrate the most here is the dedicated career employees who work here at the Treasury Department, the over 70,000 of them who have come here to serve their country um, in various ways, including the people who work on issues of anti-corruption um, throughout the department. And the reality is that when we think about corruption, we think about illicit finance, this isn't only the work of a small group of people here at Treasury Department. It is something that cuts through the entire department that every employee cares deeply about, that they work they work on to ensure that our nation's financial system um, has integrity, that they are using that integrity to further our national means and to help create opportunity here in the United States, but also around the world. Um, like so many people um, in our country, they care deeply about making sure that America has the resources that we need to continue to build opportunities for our children going forward. So we're Secretary Yellen and I are so grateful to have an opportunity to lead to lead these dedicated public servants who come here every day thinking about how they can make this country better. Well, wow. we're the ones who are grateful uh, for your leadership and that of Secretary Yellen, and by the way, another uh, Brookings alumni. And uh, it's just great to see 
the work that is going on today, the department. And I'll ask the norm to rejoin us. The deputy secretary, uh, we couldn't be more honored than to have you with us today. It's a wonderful kickoff uh, to our own launch. Uh, we feel so good about the, the, the hands within uh, that, that hold the treasury department up and the great work that you're doing. So thank you very much for joining us today. And Norm, if I may, uh, I'll turn it over to you so you can thank the Deputy Secretary uh, and we'll continue with your panel. Thank you, John. Thank you, Deputy Secretary Adiyamo. And um, uh, what a stimulating conversation to help launch the Democracy Summit Week, the uh, U.S. government's new anti-corruption strategy and those uh, powerful concrete steps uh, that uh, Treasury and the administration are taking. We're very grateful uh, that you were able to be with us, Deputy Secretary and John, as always, we thank you for your leadership and for participating today and making all the work that we do at Brookings possible. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you for having me. Take care. With that, I'm very privileged now to uh, begin uh, the second half uh, of our event, uh, which will focus on uh, the inaugural summit uh, for democracy and launch our uh, democracy playbook 2021, uh, the Democracy Summit Edition. Uh, this uh, document. Uh, which is available on the Brookings website. If you just Google Brookings Democracy Playbook, you'll find it or look for it on our website. And we're gonna give you um, uh, other uh, uh, references to it. I really hope folks will take a look at it. We're, we're launching it this week to help provide uh, our humble suggestions on content for the um, Democracy Summit, as the uh, world's nations, civil society, and other stakeholders gather together um, this week, uh, formally convening on Thursday and Friday, to determine how to halt democratic backsliding and advance democracy all over the world. Uh, it's a really unique uh, op uh, opportunity, including the year of action that will follow in 2022, leading up to the second convening of the summit and, and our second edition of the Democracy Playbook uh, is designed to, um, to help inform that critically important process with our 10 commitments. As I say, like the 10 commandments, the 10 commitments that we would like to see participants in the Democracy Summit make, whether government, civil society, or otherwise. And uh, in our playbook, we um, uh, lay those out, back them up by social science, longstanding practice in order to, uh, in order to uh, help inform that year of action that lies ahead. Our panel is going to survey all three of the pillars of the Democracy Summit this week, and all of them are addressed in our Democracy Playbook uh, that is uh, anti-corruption, which will be our main focus, but also um, activities to halt democratic backsliding and to protect human rights. Democratic backsliding, anti-corruption, uh, human rights protection, those are the three pillars, uh, the focus of the Democracy Summit this week, but we will principally, but not exclusively, focus on anti-corruption. So I'm going to uh, both introduce our distinguished panelists, which includes two of my co-authors and close colleagues from in and outside of government. Uh, uh, but I'm, as I do that, uh, I'm going to uh, ask each of them a question. So let me begin by Introducing Jennifer Lewis. She is the Deputy Director of the Anti-Corruption Task Force at USAID. Uh, Jennifer, what is the number one thing, specific and concrete please, 
that you would like to see come out of the Democracy Summit this week? Well, thank you so much, Norm. And I'd just like to start by noting how thrilled I'm to be joining you here today on this day of the release of our new US anti-corruption strategy and the start for the Summit for Democracy. Um, it's truly been a year unlike any other for those of us working on anti-corruption across the US government. And I think it's worth underscoring at the top the priority that's been placed by this administration on anti-corruption and really what it means for us as a community. Um, at USAID, we've long understood corruption as both a corrosive threat to democracy, as was mentioned earlier, but also truly as an enemy of development. And our administrator recently said, corruption is essentially development in reverse. And so I think one of the things um, in terms of our great hopes for the summit and my personal great hope for the summit is that in addition to witnessing countries take on bold new commitments to fighting corruption, such as the ones we just heard now from the deputy secretary on the US side, is for us to walk away as a democracy community with a true understanding of the need to infuse anti-corruption across all of our work, whether it's on human rights, um, whether it's on electoral integrity, we simply cannot meet the ambition that we collectively have in defending democracy against multiple threats, rising authoritarianism, um, diminishing of human rights, and of course, against other even more existential crises, such as addressing climate change without tackling this fundamental issue. So concretely, I think there needs to be an understanding of the transnational nature of corruption and therefore that it is a global problem that requires global solutions. Um, for our part, we hope that we're walking away with a mutual understanding that to fight corruption, we cannot and should not go it alone. We need to start working with our global allies and partners. And we really see this summit as a clear starting point. And I just wanna mention one other thing that I really think it's important to not see this summit as a one-off event that we walk away with, you know, one particular piece going forward. It's really the beginning of a process and indeed a transformation, hopefully, of how we are defending democracy and countering corruption. The idea is to leave here on December 10th with a clear agenda for what we are calling the year of action between summits one and two, and as well a clear commitment to supporting our partners in raising this collective ambition that's needed for the fight ahead. Thank you, uh, Jennifer. And uh, speaking of that year of action, I'm going to turn to our next panelist, Dr. Alina Polyakova, uh, one of our co authors on our democracy playbook and the president and CEO of SEPA, the Center for European Policy Analysis, also a former and much loved Brookings colleague of ours, like uh, the Deputy Secretary. Um, Alina, um, what do you <clears throat> hope to see from the summit and year of action? And how does the democracy playbook inform your hopes? Thanks, thanks so much, Norm. It's really uh, wonderful to be back here with you uh, again. Uh, putting on uh, a bit of my former Brookings hat and uh, with the other colleagues on the on the on the conversation here, um, I wanted to pick up on what I think is a really important point that the deputy secretary made in the earlier discussion that speaks directly to what uh, we were trying to uh, urge the administration to think through uh, when it comes to the future of global democracy, um, and that is the need to work across and with multilateral institutions to engage our alliances, um, to really mobilize our allies in the democratic world around a, a core agenda and to reinvigorate um, the US broader uh, interagency engagement. And I think uh, having all of these different uh, US agencies represented in our conversation here, as well as earlier uh, with the Deputy Secretary of the Treasury, is just really important to send a signal that we're all on the same page and we're all in the same boat and we're all fighting for the same values and principles. And this is, of course, a core part of the democracy playbook. Um, as you mentioned, Norm, uh, the research that we conducted uh, across so many different academic uh, disciplines and social sciences to really understand what works and what matters. One of the takeaways has been that international institutions have a huge capacity uh, to influence the trajectory of democracy still, despite uh, the conversations we've had about 
uh, the challenges around democracy promotion across the world. And of course, if we look across uh, we don't, the Atlantic, we don't have to go very far to see some serious challenges to democratic governance um, in countries like Hungary, for example, uh, which uh, isn't part of the democracy summit, I think for very, very obvious reasons. So to my mind, the focus on what international institutions, agencies can do, what US agencies can do like USAID, like the State Department to work with our allies, to build a cohesive and comprehensive strategy on everything from anti-corruption to supporting independent journalism, uh, to working at the local level with democracy, advocacy groups, with democracy activists, uh, to ensure that what we are doing is reflecting the kinds of issues and problems that we're seeing emerge on the ground in some of these countries. And I think first and foremost, uh, we need to really bring in all of our core allies and really understand what we can do at the level of the G7, the G20, and other multilateral and international agreements of that nature. Um, I'm really excited to see what the year of action will lead to. Um, you know, the event this week is just part of the conversation. I think the Democracy Playbook basically provides what could be seen as a roadmap for where the year could go and how we can engage allies um, and how we can get on the same page about what we can really do to invest in our common desire to see a world that is uh, moving towards greater openness and greater freedom, not towards closed societies, which is of course something that many authoritarian states would like to see um, the world move in that direction. Thank you, Alina. Ian Gary, my friend, the executive director of the Financial Accountability and Corporate Transparency Coalition, FACT. Um, what do you make of the new anti-corruption strategy that uh, the US government has launched today, the deputy secretary's remarks in that regard, and to what extent does that exemplify the kinds of specific concrete commitments that we've targeted in our playbook um, and that are necessary to advance both anti-corruption, but also democracy? What's your view, Ian? Thanks, Norm. I think uh, my view is that Christmas came early for anti-corruption advocates in the uh, FACT coalition. and. If we had it's put just together... in time for the eighth night of Hanukkah. <laughs> that early is just in yeah. time. Yeah, just in time. And if we had put together uh, a wish list for uh, anti-corruption Santa, so many of the things that we've been fighting for at the FACT Coalition for over a decade are on that uh, anti-corruption strategy and were highlighted by uh, Deputy Secretary Adeyemo. So it's a really exciting day. We think the anti-corruption strategy is a, is a very big deal. I think one of the things that is important about the remarks that were made uh, just now by the deputy secretary is that there's a real recognition that the problems of illicit finance globally are in a large part, uh, the US is in a large part responsible for some of those problems. And it's a recognition that we are a major offshore uh, financial jurisdiction. As uh, the deputy secretary mentioned, the ill-gotten gains from dictators and kleptocrats and criminals uh, often wind up in places like Miami and South Dakota. So I think in terms of uh, the strategy and his remarks, they were spot on. And I would hope to see within the, the summit uh, uh, later this week that the US continues to um, put forward a strong set of very concrete measures to address the gaps in our regulatory system, including around real estate, um, anonymous shell companies, and the private equity industry. And I think with that kind of uh, approach um, and the multilateral action that uh, Alina and Jennifer and others have indicated, we can make a, a huge dent in this scourge. Um. Thank you, Ian. And friends, if you want to look at our Democracy Playbook 2021 Democracy Summit Edition, uh, which calls for many of the specific anti-corruption actions, plus a host of other 
pro-democracy commitments in detail. You can find that on the event page where you're watching this streaming. If you just scroll down, you'll find the link to the report. Um, uh, Michael Jarvis, you are the executive director of the Transparency and Accountability Initiative. We've worked in this field for many years. We work together, among other places, in our um, leveraging uh, transparency to reduce corruption initiative that Brookings co-leads with results for development. Uh, my wonderful partners, uh, Mario Picon and Robin Lewis, who helped manage that initiative, and we work together. Michael, I wonder if you could um, preview for us a little bit. I know you have a very important essay and op-ed coming out this week, talking about some of these themes. Let me take you back to the summit that we're ramping up to, so privileged to have the first uh, launch event in civil society on this Monday uh, morning, but um, with the summit itself taking place on Thursday and Friday, what are the specific things you're looking for to come out of this convening and the year of action so that it's real, not just blah, blah, blah? Thanks, Norm, and thanks to Brookings for, for organizing this and the Deputy Secretary. I mean, I think I can boil it down to ambition, to be honest. There was a, an interesting piece by the Financial Times columnist last week, Jan Ganesh, around by, is there a risk around this summit that by emphasizing a sense of crisis around democracy that we're actually playing into the hands of autocrats, that you know, they want to have this narrative that they have the momentum. And I think one way to assuage those concerns is, is to lay out a set of steps, very concrete things that the participating countries are going to do that are concrete and ambitious. And I thought the Deputy Secretary, as Ian said, did a good job of setting a good stage and precedent for other countries to follow on um, this morning. I, and I think, thought his framework worked well, too. Like If you think about increasing enforcement, increasing transparency, deepening partnerships, you can think about what ambition looks like in each one of those and increasing enforcement like there's no shortage of existing commitments that have been made in other fora that countries just need to double down and enforce and put the resources behind um increasing transparency i would complement with thinking about increasing participation and agency and getting us towards accountability but for that to me the year of action is a big opportunity like we're not gonna have the perfect set of things outlined in, at the end of this week, but we do have this year leading up to hopefully another summit where we can explore and figure out what are the next generation of commitments that, that we should be making. Um, and if we can have a multi-stakeholder process to do that and learn from each other, and you know, there are still areas where the US needs to learn from other countries. It, it's great to see the advances on corporate Transparency Act implementation, but that still is not public beneficial ownership information, for example. There are other countries joining the summit who have experience on that front. At the same time, they could be learning from the US on foreign bribery actions or the real estate innovations that were announced today. So, and that leads me with the last point around the deepening partnerships where I think working with the TEI sort of funder community, we're always looking at ways to reinforce multi-stakeholder action and hopefully this year of action can be a place for that. And I'd be, you know, we, we support many civil society partners who've been fighting hard for a lot of the things that were outlined this morning in the speech from the deputy secretary. And hopefully fighting for a lot of the things that other countries will announce later this week. But, you know, commitments need time to be developed. They need to be, you know, you need to build infrastructure to enforce them properly. And that, perhaps that's where bilateral donors, and I'm looking at Jennifer and the work that we could do together with say USAID, but, and then our philanthropic funders that are part of the TI community as well could, could partner together to support what those ideation processes look like and put some money behind implementation um, so that five years from now, we're having a very different conversation from today. Um, this, is, this is it. This year is the moment. We've worked, all of us and so many other allies um, for so many decades to get to this 
point. Um, and, and so, um, and so we appreciate that reflection, Michael. Finally, last but far from least, my friend, the co-author of our report, uh, Jonathan Katz, the Senior Fellow and Director of Democracy Initiatives at GMF, uh, who helps uh, lead uh, the uh, Transatlantic Democracy Working Group, another co-sponsor, which I co-chair, working closely with John. You've heard what everyone else wants to see come out of the Democracy Summit, John, and you worked so, so hard to bring together today. We really, we I really thank you for that uh, behind the scenes for so many months. Um, how does our democracy playbook relate to what you've heard, John, from all of the prior panelists about their hopes and aspirations uh, for, um, uh, for what we want to accomplish at the Democracy Summit this week, the world's democracies, government, civil societies, and other stakeholders, and the year of action, and then the, the reconvening ahead. Yeah. Bring us home on how the playbook relates to that. Please. Yeah, this, this was, um, first of all, thank you for, for having me participate, but also be part of this great group effort um, that I think is really uh, well connected uh, to to the summit, uh, the democracy playbook, which is a, which is a summit edition, uh, but also to have the deputy secretary <clears throat> this morning really I think hit it out of the park uh, on the summit for democracy week. Uh, I think somebody mentioned Christmas Hanukkah has come early for the anti corruption mm -hmm. community, uh, but but really. I think he set off really a, a really set off this week in the right way. I call it sort of a giant leap forward uh, in combating corruption. Uh, and I think what I heard from him is that there are going to be uh, maybe more announcements throughout this week uh, that are connected to the anti-corruption strategy, but also from uh, from Treasury Secretary Yellen, who I believe will be speaking at the at the summit as well. And and of course. Since it's a whole government approach, which you spoke about, I'm sure that uh, that the USAID administrator, uh, the Secretary of State, and others will be speaking directly, and other department and agencies will be speaking to this issue. Uh, but you asked about how this this connects. I, I can't think of anything better when you when you write a a playbook and a strategy, and one of your commitments, you can almost we can't actually just check the box yet on it, but one of our commitments was focused on strengthening this anti-corruption, uh, strengthening these efforts. Uh, but I think uh, I think with the with the summit and this playbook, how they intersect is really one. You point out uh, this renewal effort to renew democracy, also a sense of optimism. Um, and, I, and when I heard the deputy secretary speak today, um, it reminds me of all those that are engaged: democracy actors globally, governments, uh, civil society, media, private sector, and others. And so our 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 summit for democracy playbook. Uh, is instructive not only to uh, renewing democracy on the anti-corruption uh, effort and, and issue, but it lays out a number of different areas that are critical to advance and renew democracy, but also to promote human rights, which is a critical component uh, of the summit as well. And I really think of it in when we when I look at the playbook and I'm, I'm listening to the administration and democracy advocates globally to talk about you know, sort of a, a four-pronged uh, uh, strategy, one of, of this development and resource needs that have been talked about, that we talk about in the playbook that Jennifer spoke about. I hear bits and pieces with Michael and Alina, also in the, in the deputy secretary speech, the need to increase resources and funding uh, for civil society for independent media. When I think about the 0.3% the of all uh, development assistance that goes to independent media, I realize you know, that it's just not adequate. So when you look at issues like funding and resources, you look at that type of support that the United States has been providing, but can certainly be doing more, and our partners as well. The other part is the internal resources, which I heard the Deputy Secretary loud and clear, that if you wanna enforce if you want to uh, enforce you know, tax enforcement or you want uh, you know, parts of the US government to be able to, uh, to carry out these activities globally or other countries as well, uh, which was said too, they need the infrastructure and funding. Then we need the diplomacy, which is happening this week at the summit. 
the year of action, the summit next year. Hopefully there'll be a, a, a summit in, in perpetuity every year uh, that we'll see democracies globally step up to pick up the ball from this administration so that we continue to have this. And in our summit playbook, uh, playbook for democracy, we talk about the importance of strengthening these international institutions and their capacities and capabilities. Not only are we looking at these larger, the UN system, but looking at regional bodies like ECOWAS or looking across the globe where democracy uh, can be fought for, uh, where we can address things like anti-corruption issues or support for civil society and human rights. So we have development, uh, diplomacy, and then defense. Um, you couldn't start off better than with General Allen, but what he pointed out was defense isn't always about use of military, it's about creating those ecosystems that prevent these bad things from happening and investment in those. Uh, we play a lot of defense globally uh, to, you know, in the need to address these challenges, but that has to be part of this effort is the defense, defense of democracy, defense when we see uh, malign actors, including in the United States or leaders in the United States that are doing things that undermine democracy. And I think there is no greater challenge we can see that right here at home in the United States to defending democracy and what that means, uh, what a difference it makes between last year uh, then and where we are today to have a summit like this. And I think we shouldn't forget uh, how important that is. And the last, I would just say going on the offense. And I, I felt listening to the deputy secretary, you know, and looking at our playbook, it's as much about going on the offense as it is playing defense which is taking these steps, making these declarations, putting the resources in. And I see this every day, not only at, you know, from our USAID at US Treasury, but USAID and others working every day, going on the offensive, figuring out ways, not only to play defense, but getting ahead. And I think this is incredibly important. Uh, when we look at the summit playbook, it's about going on the offensive, it's about defense, diplomacy, and then also development of resources. Thank you. John, um, so I'm going to ask all the panelists to unmute or at least to have their unmute button at the ready. Uh, and, um, and we're going to do the best part of the second best part of the panel, which is the free for all. I have a couple questions for the entire panel. And then I have amazing dozens and dozens of amazing questions that have poured in from our very stimulated uh, viewing audience, uh, which is marvelous. Um, my first question to the panel is, we've uh, addressed the anti-corruption pillar of the summit um, at length, and anti-corruption is one of the uh, uh, areas of the 10 commitments in our democracy playbook and one of the three pillars of the summit. But we've assumed the importance of anti-corruption as part of democracy. Can I ask all of you to unpack a little bit and, and I'll play devil's advocate. Okay, fighting democratic backsliding, I get that. That should be part of a democracy summit. And human rights have been strongly identified with democracy from the very beginning, uh, from uh, ancient, Athens, um, but anti-corruption, uh, of all the pillars, why make anti-corruption a focus and why are we hitting it so hard today? Panelists? I can start, Norm, from a civil society perspective and taking Europe as an example here. Um, I think the clear answer to that from what we've seen um, in terms of how democratic backsliding begins in democracies is that corruption is at the heart of this. Um, it is how uh, disinformation, state-sponsored disinformation attacks are, are uh, financed. Um, it is how media freedoms are repressed by, for example, illicit sources going- Let me stop um, you, Lena. How does, what's the disinformation connection? Yeah, of course. With anti-corruption and, we, and yeah. democracy. Well, well, we've seen over and over again in many, many countries where we've seen a reversal of democratic governance is uh, a desire to clamp down independent media. So public resources that are illicitly acquired then go into the pockets of those close to the regime, 
uh, that then, you know, basically sponsors or completely buys outright media outlets that then spread misleading narratives uh, about democracy, the sp spread misleading narratives about public health issues. We've seen this very, very clearly in COVID in the COVID-19 era. And really the model for this has been Moscow and Russia um, and the way that the Kremlin regime has used um, illicit finance to push through and deploy very, very damaging anti-democratic narratives um, and also to sponsor all kinds of different proxy groups, troll farms. We may remember one of those troll farms from the 2016 elections. How was that funded? Through illicit finance and corruption. Okay. It, Michael, go for it. Yeah, well, I was so my home country is the UK, and I was just reading the papers this weekend, and there was a survey that's come out that shows that public perceptions of politicians are that 63% now believe they're only in politics for themselves, and only 5% believe they're in it for the public good. And a lot of that when they dug deeper, reflected people's reactions to a stream of scandals that really relate to corruption. Um, these, some of those are related to the pandemic, these chumocracy deals where, you know, those who were politically connected got access to um, procurement deals ahead of others. Um, so you're seeing a direct tie between perceptions of corruption, realities of corruption, and trust in government. And that undermines faith in the democratic process as well. You're going to be more amenable to you know some of those disinformation risks that Alina just highlighted if your perception is that you know your existing system and those who are representing it um, are only in it for themselves so I think we need to have strong rules crack down on corruption and that in turn has the reinforcing sort of positive health effects on the democratic system as a whole and you know it starts at home and uh, that you know, yes, we need to be clamping down on these loopholes and ways of illicit money coming in that only take advantage of those things. But there are some basic things as outlined in your playbook that um, we need to be, pick up from the start. If I could jump and in. Remember, though. friends. Yes, go ahead, Ian. I was just going to say, remember, friends, you can look at the playbook on the event website where you're streaming this. There's a link or simply Google Brookings Democracy Playbook, although the Democracy Playbook is the uh, child of all of the different uh, institutions uh, who uh, co-authored it. All right, uh, Ian, I think you were going to jump in. Yes, and uh, just to add to Alina and Michael, I think the connections are very clear when you think about kleptocracy as <clears throat> not the rule of an individual, um, but a systematic uh, rule that includes both systems of, of corruption and patronage within the country concerned, but flows of illicit finance around the world. And, you know, paradoxically, uh, uh, corrupt leaders want to find rule of law institutions and rule of law countries as safe havens uh, to park their ill-gotten gains. And that's why you see, you know, Russian oligarchs are buying, a, <laughs> you know, British Premier League uh, soccer teams uh, and real estate in Miami because they know that we have strong rule of law institutions and they're not, um, they're afraid that um, if they keep their money at home, it's insecure. And so I think we have to think as uh, Casey Michelle has said in his recent book about America kleptocracy as kleptocracy is a global system and the US is participating in it as long as we have all of these gaping loopholes related to say real estate or private uh, investment funds that uh, uh, Deputy Secretary outlined. I was so glad to hear the Deputy Secretary talk about uh, jurisdictions like South Dakota and Delaware because of the, the perversity of the um, attraction, the magnetism for a kleptocrats of the United States on the one hand or other rule of law, strong rule of law systems on the one hand, they seek the protections that um, uh, our democratic systems provide. On the other hand, we have some gaping loopholes that make those uh, that make those protections even more attractive. Where you have states that have this extreme uh, secrecy uh, that uh, I think the 
Jennifer, the, the new strategy that uh, the United States government is implementing is really, is really gonna target. Um, before I move to my next question, um, I, I did wanna point out, uh, Alina, on, on your point about um, subverting a, a free and independent press and uh, turning it as we've seen in Turkey with Erdogan, in Hungary with Orban, uh, turning the press in using corruption to turn alleged corruption to turn the press into an instrumentality of anti-democratic forces. Uh, John, you've done some very interesting work at GMF, and I really it's a model partnership because you've done this with the Slovak government yeah. uh, and with um, our wonderful uh, new uh, ambassador to the United States of Slovakia, Radovan Javorčík, uh, in um, in boosting independent media. So before we go, and Jennifer, I'm going to come to you first on the next question. But before we do that, John, do you just want to reflect any further on Alina's point yeah. about the critical importance of an independent? free media and individual journalists to making the whole virtuous cycle uh, of, um, of democracy work. Absolutely, and I think the, the, what you point to in terms, I just wanted to highlight Slovakia, but other countries that have really stepped up to provide leadership and of course, uh, journalism, investigative journalism, free media, um, is, is under assault uh, in, in a number of spaces. We have challenges in the United States as well, uh, including in the, in the previous administration in particular. And so I think, uh, you know, we've looked very hard at what the needs are, uh, you know, for in independent media um, and the importance. And I, and I do think this is one area where I hope we, we, we spell it out in the playbook um, but also I think I'm hearing hopefully from the administration as well that this is a key area where the U.S. will be pushing hard uh, because there's an understanding about the devastating impact of disinformation. We've seen it during COVID-19, uh, which has been particularly acute and problematic, including in the United States as well. And so uh, with the Slovak government, uh, we looked hard at how do you support, for example, investigative journalists who are on the front lines of democracy reporting on corruption. And it was also mentioned by, uh, by the deputy secretary, the importance of this ecosystem of, of, of civil society, of uh, investigative journalists, um, of law enforcement and government and all these different pieces to challenge uh, corrupt actors and your question was about authoritarians. And when you, you know, trust in democracy is critical, authoritarians are trying to undermine that trust over and over again because they're, they're not, they don't have free and fair elections in countries like Russia. So they're not playing to that playbook. So corruption is this calling card of authoritarians. Uh, and of course, when you have investigative journalists, others uh, like Mr. Navalny exposing uh, Mr. Putin and his corruption, they're usually targeted. And so uh, authoritarians are directly connected to the worst human rights abusers globally. Um, they're the most corrupt actors globally and the ecosystems around them in their countries also uh, mirror that unless it's changed. So if you want good governance, if you want free and independent media, uh, those resources have to put into have to be put into this. And I, I do want to thank the Slovak government because I um, and and others that are looking at how best to increase their support because it is a key component um, of addressing both authoritarians and corruption and protecting human rights globally. Uh, Jennifer, I'm going to come to you for the next question, and then we're going to throw it open to the panel. Um, Moving beyond um, uh, the anti-corruption pillar alone, can you um, explain why from the USAID perspective and from uh, the uh, State Department perspective and from your perspective as someone who has long worked in this area, um, anti-corruption interfaces with the human rights pillar of the Democracy Summit. 
Sure, thanks a lot. Um, well, I think this really relates to the question you had previously, and you challenged us to to think about why why anti corruption should sit in a democracy summit. And I would I would argue that um, corruption is an existential threat to democracy. A lot of these have been laid out by the previous panelists in terms of the links to autocracy, kleptocracy, right? Um, the links to globalized corruption trends. But I'll just take it from a development angle. We're a development agency, um, and this is our bread and butter. This is what we see all day, all around the world, the way in which corruption fundamentally undermines development progress across all sectors. And that's the case, whether it's in health or education or economic growth or in our, you know, our outcomes in biodiversity. And this is something that the deputy secretary just emphasized as well in his remarks. Um, you know, indeed, when you really dig into these issues, you see that corruption is at the root of almost every development ill. It's really the anti-development strategy, something that's always been the case. And this is not new, you know, this is not news to anyone. Corruption is a problem as old as time, but you know, the fundamental shift that we have seen in this last decade is one that has really transformed corruption from a community-based or country-based program, a known, a pervasive systemic nuisance really to one of epic importance for democracy. And that has everything to do with both this, the increased scope and scale of corruption, right? We talked about this um, on this panel, the scope of corruption morphing really into a global phenomena beyond the purview of individual countries, uh, related to kleptocracy and organized crime and strategic corruption. And all of this really relies on weaknesses at the country level in the oversight and regulatory processes, as well as the gaps in the financial, the global financial system that have been referenced by the deputy secretary. Um, corrupt actors are using these, exploiting these weaknesses to pilfer public resources that should be available for development. Um, and to launder and then hide the proceeds of their graft. You know, we've talked about how these proceeds end up in destination countries, um, but we also need to really underscore what was mentioned also by the Deputy Secretary, which is, which is the effect on communities and countries in terms of the diversion of these life-saving um, and other public resources. We've seen the scale of corruption increase um, as corrupt actors are able to access some of these international networks of illicit uh, financing crime, but also the networks of exploitation um, that, that really damage marginalized communities. And I'll just say, you mentioned ancient Greece, perhaps not, but you know, in 1776, John Adams wrote that government is instituted for the common good, for the protection, safety, prosperity, and happiness of the people, not for the profit, honor, or private interest of any one man, family, or class of men. So we have it right there from one of the founding fathers, government is meant to serve the people, not to take from them. And so that's why this is at this summit. Uh, we cannot address these other issues without addressing this fundamental tenet of accountability to the people. So turning to your human rights question in particular, I think it's been pretty clear uh, with some of the statistics that were mentioned earlier, the corruption of institutions that are created to defend human rights that were specifically created to defend, including, for example, the justice system. This has a corrosive impact on individuals in their, around the world. And of course, it always heaviest on the marginalized and the most vulnerable. Transparency International, for example, estimated 80% of people across 15 countries in Asia paid for public health services, such as healthcare. In the water and sanitation sector, the World Bank has estimated that corruption depletes between 20 and 40% of access to water investments, which of course has severe impacts on the poor. And then of course, corruption itself funds labor and human rights violations, as well as trafficking of wildlife and arms and drugs and people. And so this is really the way in which these themes are interwoven, a very purposeful weaving together of themes. Um, and I do want to mention, though, that while it's important to recognize the connections between the problem sets that the summit is seeking to address, it's also worth mentioning that both the commitments and the actions that we need to take these pillars, you know, to address the problems in these pillars are also connected and interlinked. And some of them were mentioned earlier, whether it's, you know, looking at this from an ecosystem perspective, making sure that we are strengthening government capacity while also enhancing and empowering civil society and media actors to serve as watchdogs and to detect and expose corruption and human rights violations and authoritarianism. Um, these are all really connected. 
we basically need countries to take bold new actions to disrupt the status quo in these three areas um, and to dismantle the systems that support them. Um, and at the end of the day, we need to emerge from this with broader coalitions and networks of our own, which is why I'll underscore that I think one of our hopes is this idea that these are not separate buckets, but very interrelated, whether you're talking about disinformation or uh, going after anti-corruption or human rights activists and, and imperiling them for speaking truth to power. This is something we need to come together with uh, to get together on um, as a community. Thank you. Uh... Thank you, Jennifer. That was a powerful answer. And it also tied together uh, the three pillars. So, um, so with that, I'm, I'm now, uh, we've been balancing the time between our panelists and uh, we have about 10 minutes left in the seminar. So what I'm going to do now is go to the audience questions. And I'm gonna ask the panelists, please, because I wanna take as many audience questions as I can. So I'm gonna ask you to be very disciplined as you answer. Um, Ian, this one is for you from uh, uh, Sujata Holman, who's a physician. How can we prevent corruption from getting in, a way, in the way of appropriate and just allocation of infrastructure money. This is something we, we, that is of hot importance in the United States at the moment, but globally too, as we recover from the pandemic, uh, of uh, appropriate and just allocation of infrastructure money on a state and local level. Thanks, Norm. I, I think one of the important um, aspects to this question is looking at how the international uh, donors have responded to the coronavirus pandemic, as well as how uh, multilateral donors like the World Bank and IMF has, have responded. And if you look at some of the IMF emergency loans to um, developing countries that have high governance and anti-corruption risks, they have uh, asked for information, for example, on beneficial owners of of uh, companies that are getting procurement contracts. Um, they've asked for auditing, um, but we're still seeing corruption in the, in the uh, infrastructure sector and in the procurements related to, to COVID. And I think we need stronger and more mandatory requirements attached to um, international uh, funding for um, infrastructure and pandemic response. So that would be one of my short answers. Yes or no, the new U.S. anti-corruption strategy that we've announced today, will it help? It's integrated domestic and international strategy. Will it help on this infrastructure corruption front? It, it certainly has to help. I mean, in terms of corruption risk. Well, it's a sector, yes or no question. I'll yeah, take yes for an answer. is top of the list. <laughs> Okay, um, the next question is from Ricardo Spraglin of US ICE Immigration and Customs Enforcement. He's a chaplain program administrator there. Do we truly recognize the insidiousness of this issue of anti-corruption? Uh, Jennifer, do you think this is something that is truly recognized in the United States and globally? I think it's truly recognized across the US government. Um, and I think it's something that folks in the US government working on these issues have known for a long time. We're seeing it today with the release of our strategy, uh, this unequivocal statement that this is a national security imperative and that it is corrosive to all of our democratic institutions and processes. You heard it from the Secret Deputy Secretary earlier. It's also corrosive to our financial system and therefore the futures of average Americans around the country. And so I think there is an absolute moment and a recognition. I don't know whether the question was going to the general American public, but I think that's part of our task as a government and as an anti-corruption community is to socialize this issue to really make people understand why it should matter to them and why they should fight for and, it. Uh, and, and as a panel, that's why we're doing what we're doing today. And that's why we put the playbook out there. 
Michael Jarvis, you are a transparency expert, and Sophia Yan of NYU Law Tax Law Center, where she's an attorney advisor, wants to know what role should transparency around tax reporting play in anti-corruption policy? A great deal. Um, I mean, this has been a long sought after um, demand for good reason. Like if, if we understand who's paying taxes um, in each jurisdiction, we're able to minimize uh, tax avoidance and tax evasion. Um, and we're also able to see where these flows of money are, and it links to the beneficial ownership transparency we've been talking about, the procurement transparency. As you build these up, you really close off the different ways that these um, works of illicit finance flow. And it gets to this core point about fairness and, and showing like faith in democracy also, I think, reflects fairness in the sense of how the system works and who's gaining from it and who's gaining it. So again, tax transparency is a, is a key angle there. But I also just wanted to add a point on the last question is, we have to be aware that we're not the only ones who claim an anti-corruption narrative. China is very strong on anti-corruption, but it's highly politically controlled and motivated. Um, so we need to emphasize the human rights and the anti-authoritarian authoritarian dimensions alongside it because the package together is, is the differentiator. We're not the only ones who sort of claim cracking down on a corruption as a way to sort of uh, win public favor. Lena Polyakova, we talked about the following issue, which Judge Vanessa Ruiz, uh, the immediate past president of the International Association of Women Judges and a um, judge on the District of Columbia's highest court, the DC Court of Appeals, um, asks, uh, how do you view the rule of law and an independent judiciary. We had a lot of back and forth on this in the report, including comments from experts. Uh, as part of the anti-corruption agenda, how do you view that, Alina, and how do we address it in the democracy playbook? Well, Norm, as you said, this was a big part of our work on the democracy playbook uh, to really outline, uh, especially how uh, so democratically elected leaders uh, start to push back uh, in, in a creep kind of way, very small steps and incursions against judicial independence. And over time, what that of course leads to um, is setbacks um, in the rule of law uh, when our judiciary systems no longer act as a check on the executive, as a check on other powers that be. Uh, and we see this happening as part of this sort of autocrats playbook um, across the world over and over again, together with some of the other issues we've been talking about. And again, I think corruption fuels um, all of this. Uh, you know, in many countries, unfortunately, uh, the price for a judge is, is known almost as public information. Um, and this is exactly why illicit financial flows and uh, having a real conversation, raising greater awareness about corruption is so key uh, when it comes to rule of law in particular, uh, because when we start to lose transparency and trust in the judicial process, this is where um, I think we hit real problems when it comes to democratic governance more broadly. Thank you. Thank you, Alina. Um, and finally, uh, John Katz, um, I'm going to ask you, uh, because we're almost out of time, just for a 30-second answer. It's one of the most important questions we got from Bob Jundef, the chair of the Social Security Advisory Board. Can foreign nations and foreign cultures be uh, affected by U.S. policy? And I'm going to make a friendly amendment when the U.S. has had so many struggles. Short answer, John. Yeah, uh, you know, United States has long been a leader in, in support of democracy. We're the world's oldest democracy. And I think the, the Summit for Democracy, what you're seeing in the playbook, outline how the U.S. renews democracy globally. Secretary, uh, Deputy Secretary Adeyemo pointed out that this has to happen with partners globally, with civil society, private sector, with others. And, and the United States isn't coming into this and has been very clear that the challenges are at home, they're domestic, and they're international. And so there's, I think the U.S. is, is credible at presenting these, these next steps at the summit uh, as we lay out in the, in the playbook. 
But I, I don't think the U.S. is coming at this from a position of saying that we don't have our own struggles and challenges. The goal here is to address both of them at the same time, both at home and abroad. And I think that's what the administration is really set out to do. And we heard from the deputy secretary steps that impact the United States domestically, but also will impact both partners abroad and the ability to address authoritarians, corruption and protect human rights. I wanna thank all of my panelists, the deputy secretary, John Allen, Brookings, all of the sponsoring organizations, all of the co-authors of the Democracy Playbook. You can find the link to the playbook right here on the event page uh, and or by Googling Brookings Democracy Playbook. What a great launch to the week of the Democracy Summit and to this critical period in fighting anti-corruption but also its relationship to promoting human rights and reversing democratic backsliding. Thanks everyone for joining us. We'll be back with you during this year of action as we hold the world's democracies feet to the fire to make sure they make and live up to their commitments as we've laid out uh, our recommendations in the democracy Playbook 2021 Democracy Summit Edition. Thanks, everyone. Great having you with us. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.